Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Njambi Rono. I am a developer advocate at Open Knowledge International, and it's really great to see all of you here. Thank you for sitting in for the session. Um, so we ran a frictionless data pre-conference workshop yesterday, and so today I'm going to be summarizing a lot of what we talked about yesterday, and hopefully uh, we will be a step closer to um, working together towards a frictionless data future. Um, so in the second half of 2015, I had the opportunity to speak at a data boot camp in Karachi. And one of the other speakers at that conference was Amna Iqbal. And she shared this um, illustration with us. And she said that up until that point, a lot of the people that she talked to about data and presented data to um, usually described this as their experience and understanding of data, so a meaningless doodle. And while she used this image to push for, um, to advocate for creating better data visualizations to create, uh, to be able to communicate information better, I am borrowing this image today um, to pass along, you know, the point that um, if you're not, not from a specific domain, and if you're provided with data from that domain and without any context associated with it, a lot of the time that is what that data will look like to you, right? It will be impossible for you to understand it. It will be very hard for you to draw insight from it, right? And so things like that create what we call friction, right? Friction is anything that keeps you from drawing analysis and getting insight out of any data that you've been presented with very quickly. And so in the frictionless data project, we are looking at ways we can alleviate some of this friction, right? So how can we help people give better context for the data that they're working with, no matter what domain they're in, and in using a language that everyone can understand, no matter who they are, right? Um, and so the Frictionless Data Project is one of the core projects at Open Knowledge International, uh, which is a nonprofit. And we were founded in 2004. And the aim, the main mission of our organization is to help realize the value of open data to society. And so we do this by um, equipping people with skills and also by building tools for working with data to help people work with data, and also by going to the places where data publishers are. So think people like governments or like researchers who are sources of data and who push it out for people to consume. And we try and make their systems responsive to the individuals that work with data on a daily basis. So um, some of the projects that we work on at Open Knowledge International are like School of Data, which is the outfit through which we've been able to train thousands of individuals to date and tens of organizations. So what we do is we run fellowship programs where people are able to learn skills but also be able to apply them in civil society organizations they're embedded in. And also um, organizations are able to reach out to us and say we want bespoke trainings because we work with data but we want to take it to the next level and we will be able to help them with that. One of the other projects we've worked on is Open Trials, which um, is a platform we built in partnership with other orga organizations. And what it does is it's an open linked database that allows people to search for clinical trials data if it is publicly available. So it aggregates um, clinical trials data in one place, and people are able to search it and use it. Then we also um, are the people behind the Global Open Data Index, which is an annual ranking of countries by the level of openness of their data. So annually, we will put out a survey and we'll ask as many people as can to tell us um, how different um, bodies of government are open. So how open is health data in your, gov in your country? How open is transport data in your country? How open is fiscal data in your country? 
what formats is the data published in, how often is it updated, and we ask them all these questions in the survey, and once um, the crowdsourcing element is done, we have a group of experts that peer review this data, and then they're able to come up with a ranking, which we then push out to the public, and you can then use it to advocate for more openness, right, um, for your government to publish data more. And open spending is another one where we um, essentially provide a platform to allow governments to publish fiscal data and then we are valid to users like you and me um, who don't necessarily have the expertise for it to understand or um, be able to analyze it very easily on our own. We are able to uh, make it make that easier on that platform. And then we also have a network, a vibrant network um, of individuals, organizations, and government that are partners um, who are working to make data used and useful in their countries and they're a big part of who we are. Um, and you can read more about them on our website. Um, so first things first, um, we said that it's important to give people context for the data that we are presenting to them at any given time. It's important that people understand um, the methodology that you use to collect your data, um, the original sources, the people behind this data, how often it is updated, and things like that, right? Um, because data is not neutral, and if you do not do that, then what you're doing is you might um, allow for people to use your data, but they might interpret it wrongly. Right, so metadata is important to have and we are constantly finding ways uh, to make it easier for people to attach metadata to their data before sharing it out. So that people are not only drawing insight, but um, it's not just meaningful insight, but it's also accurate insight at the end of the day. Um, the other thing is we might appreciate ambiguity and ambiguity is great when it's art. And if you look at that image, you might see a rabbit or a duck and that's great, uh, you're all right. Um, and it's great for art, but when you're working with computers, it really is a nightmare, right? Um, and yesterday I gave the example of how you'd write the name of the United States of America. You can type it out as USA, the US, America, North America, um, and all those other things. And while to us in this room, that will make sense and we can all understand we are referring to the same region, to computers, that's a nightmare and our analysis will then be skewed, right? Um, so we need to constantly think of ways to standardize um, the way that information is served up. Think also about um, the way you've had to travel here. And if you're like me, <laughs> you might have been very frustrated because you have to get new plugs, etc. to be able to have access to the same electricity that you use for um, your machines back home, right? So standardization is important, um, and it just helps for people to know that they're talking about the same things in the same way, and they can interpret it in the same way, even when the people who are responsible for that data are not in the room. So for this reason, when we founded um, Open Knowledge in 2004, I wasn't there, but Rufus Pollock and others, um, they started by immersing themselves um, in the different communities that existed at the time where people were interested in opening up information. And then um, they quickly realized there was no standard definition for what constituted open and data. And it was necessary to define that so that, um, for example, if I want to look at museum data, even though I'm not from that domain, um, just by seeing the licenses attached to whatever data I'm looking at, I will be able to understand that it was open data or not. And so for that reason, the open definition, which is a standard that defines what open data is, was born, um, and it is still being used to date. So standardization it is, is great, right? We were able to, again, alleviate some of the friction that we face with working with data, making it easier for people to get to insight as they like. Think about contracting data. Almost 10 mil, 10 trillion, tens of trillions of dollars are spent annually by um, governments around the world, but it's very hard to keep them accountable. So for this reason, again, the open contracting data standard was set up by um, open contracting partnership to help 
make it easier for, say, someone in South Africa to compare that data with data from Canada and Australia and um, so see how um, they compare. So the, this standard specifically helps, people, helps governments understand how to publish data and what exactly at the bare minimum to publish so that um, the comparisons are made easy. Um, but then comes the problem, right, that you have so many standards in, in all these different domains, and they particularly like this comic um, from XKCD because you start with 14 standards and you say, no, we want one standard to rule them all, right? And at the end of the day, you end up with just one more standard um, under your belt. Um, and so while this wasn't written by us, um, this is a very useful resource by the Open Data in Institute. They realized that there were so many things that people in the data space were standardizing, um, and it was hard to keep track of them. Um, so how is data collected? What are the formats against it? What are the data types, etc.? And so they um, interviewed everyone working in the standard space and they asked them all these questions and they wrote up a gentle introduction to all the standards that are there and you can read it on that link. But they also realized it's um, a very intense topic and so you might not be able to read all of it. So they went ahead and interviewed people again and what they ended up with is a series of podcasts that you can listen to also and try and make sense of what the different standards are and if you can borrow them for use in your environment, and if not, what you can take up and extend for use in your domain. Um, frictionless data. So before I tell you more about the project, um, let's start with the problems. On my left and your right, um, we have one set of problems which I call legal barriers, and those are things that prevent, you f prevent um, data publishers from pushing data out publicly, right? And there's lots of reasons for this. It might be financial, it might be political, and those are not the issues that we look at in the Frictionless Data Project. But the issues on my right and on your left, um, issues of data quality and interoperability and discoverability and tool integration are, are, are issues that we concern ourselves with. And so what we are trying to do is reduce friction, and particularly where you're trying to move your data from one tool to another as you analyze it before you can draw insight with it or before you can share it with the world, right? Um, and so we are trying to do this in two main ways. The first way is we have a set of specifications that we've written, which are very lightweight and adaptable for use in any domain. And this is the difference between the specifications we write and the standards that um, exist. Um, frictionless data does not develop standards, we write specifications. The difference is the specifications are one level below um, standards. So you can use them as a building block, you can take the specifications we have, say you want to attach metadata to your data easily before you publish it um, wherever you are in your domain. So you take the data package specification and you use that and then you build a standard around it that is specific to your domain. So by doing that, by being domain agnostic, what, what it allows us to do is work with as many people in as many different domains as possible. The second thing we do is we understand not everyone will want to adopt the specifications or will have the technical resources to do that. So we've built tools on top of the specifications ourselves. So for example, we have tools that help you gen generate data packages if you have tabular data, for example. So you'd load your tabular data, and then what will happen is it will generate um, a schema for your tabular data, but also prompt you to um, add information that is useful metadata that you then attach to your data. It's separate from your data in the sense that it's in a JSON file right next to your data, but in one container or one folder, if you like, and then you will always share that out. JSON is machine readable. You don't have to worry about 
about typing out JSON because it's generated for you. And if there are missing things that you want to add, you can easily type them in. So in that sense, um, these tools like that for writing um, data packages, but also think about the number of times there are issues in your data, but you need to share it elsewhere. And you're not quite sure if row 1001 has an error or not. Um, we have tools for data validation. So you just feed in your data and um, it checks your data for errors. And where you connect the tools, um, the services to run continuous data validation, that's possible. Every time you run an update on your data, it will check and tell you if your data is valid or not. So such tools exist. Um, so we subscribed to the Minimines principle that the best thing to do with um, the resources that we build will be thought of by, me, by um, other people. So we set up um, the basics, um, which is the specifications that are based on be, uh, best practices. And then we trust the community to now take that up and do with it that which they think is great. And what that means is we've ended up with a wonderful community of people that have adopted the specifications and um, created integrations with tools they use or tools that they are the ones that have written. So one example is OpenRefine. If you've used OpenRefine before, you know how powerful it is. It is a lot more powerful than Excel when you're trying to clean data. And they now allow people to import data packages um, into OpenRefine, which is really great. And then if you know about Kaggle, Kaggle is, um, is a platform that likes to boast of itself as a home of data science projects. And um, they have so many people publishing data sets on their daily. So what they've done is they've also adopted the data package specification, which now requires that everyone who's uploading data on there has to attach metadata to it and um, they're using the data package specification for that, which is really great. And they also recently got acquired by Google. Um, and so we have lots more of these examples on our site. And we like to go back to the community, find out what integrations they built, and we put them all on our site um, just so anyone else who's interested can come and see. Um, like, for example, oh, there's a PostgreSQL um, integration, so how can I use that? If you use Power Query, one of our community members recently integrated the data package specification into Power Query, so you can also load data packages into Power Query. And there's so many different examples, and because everything we are building is open source, we always link back to um, um, their repositories and ours, so you can see how they did it. One other example is recent, uh, well, a while back, we worked with the cell migration standardization organization, and we helped them adopt the data package specification to package their cell migration data before they then push it into pandas for advanced analysis and visualization. That's another example. And with the UK data service, um, which is a platform that allows researchers to publish data, we then used the good tables validation, um, and they checked for the data quality of reports that are published on the platform. And then we then showed how you could then extract some of that data, take it through a pipeline easily, and publish it elsewhere or share it elsewhere um, using the appropriate licenses. And then we worked with open power system data to package their energy data um, using data packages, again, so that it will be easier to push it elsewhere for analysis and modeling. And all of this is written up in the article section of our website. Um, and we worked with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory Active Data Biology um, team to validate the metadata associated with the repositories that they have. Um, for their data. And finally, we worked with um, Naomi Penfold recently from eLife. Um, so they published loads of research data. And we 
we, they published loads of research data and we investigated how the Good Tables data validation library uh, could be used to check for the validity of data sets on there um, so that you know we'd improve the quality of data um, even as it is being served up to the eLife community. So those are just a few examples of ways we've, with, we've worked with people and we are currently looking to work with many more people as we've received um, funding to now fo focus on the research such um, communities more specifically. And we invite you to join our communities and talk to us um, in case you'd like to use up some of our specifications or understand them better or contribute to them in any way. And we also have a field guide, which is a gentle introduction to all the frictionless data tools we have, particularly for people that publish data. It's over on our website um, as the field guide. You can have a look at that. Thank you all for your time. Are there any so, questions for me? Okay. That's why you gave it to me. Any question? I've got a question. Okay. Um, so this is lovely plumbing work. Um, and plumbing, as we all know, is the hardest thing to do, particularly to get everyone else to pay attention <laughs> to the plumbing. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you've actually gathered the attention of, of all of these different partners together. Right. Yes. Um, and is that because you've got the money to do it, or is, are there other factors that oh, have contributed? We definitely, it's not because of the money. Um, so the Frictionless Data Initiative is over 10 years old, and right from the beginning, it's been a community effort, and there's been so many iterations to the different specifications we've had. And the thing is, because we started um, right from the beginning as an open source project, um, then there's been a lot of discussion around the different things that we need to do. If you actually go to our Discuss channel, you'll see that we recently had a discussion about whether or not to build out a geodata package specification. Does the geodata community need one? And while the consensus was no, there were lots of really useful discussions in there. So everything we do is in the open, and that's how we've been able to get people to collaborate with us all the time, um, because this all of this is just work that has culminated from 10 years of many different people coming together and doing open source work. Any other questions? Oh, Christy. Hi, thank you Hi. very much for your presentation. This is uh, really terrific work. I'm wondering what um, suggestions you have to folks in the audience about ways that we can get involved or mm -hmm. learn more, yeah. you know, just kind of plug into the flow of knowledge that's happening here. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I, I really rushed this, through this because, you know, the flashing of the minutes, but um, <laughs> so there's, there's many ways, and I'll walk you through them. They're all in this slide. Um, so we have everything that we build, like I said, is open source and done in the open and documented out on GitHub, and you can find all of that there. But um, our website also aggregates all of this. So we have documentation for how to work with the libraries for technical people. The field guide is a great introduction for anyone. You do not need technical expertise. On the YouTube channel, we usually like um, do screencasts and we walk people through the different tools that we put out. So you're, you're able to understand how to use it and how the different elements of it work. Um, so Gita is where we have the more um, short charts, um, where like if you had a, you are using a tool and you ran into problems, you will just type out your question and in five or so minutes, someone from the community, not necessarily the team, will be able to answer you and help you. So that's really great for like the really quick discussions you might want to have. And Discuss is where we push out all our announcements and um, where we like to have the lengthier discussions, especially about where to take the specifications or the next iterations of the tools. And so I'd really um, 
welcome you to have a look at all of that. Open Knowledge OKFN is where we post the general announcements for everything from Open Knowledge, but a lot of the frictionless data announcements also come through the um, labs account because that's where all the experiments that become mainstream work also um, go through. Right. And you can also email me directly at that email address. Um, my work is community, and so I'm, I'm here for you, and I will answer you or connect you to someone who can generally be of service. Yep. Oh, and I forgot to say, there's also Joe Barra, who's a frictionless data project manager. You can also talk to him. And there's also Lily Winfrey, who's the product lead for frictionless data. You can also talk to her. Yes. Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I guess I've got two questions. Right. What do you think um, has been most successful in your approaches to adoption? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, there's a variety of roles represented in this room. Right. Um, how can uh, we in our various roles further adoption, uh, work with you to further adoption? So. Right. Um, so like I said before, we are really looking for like more collaborations. And um, a lot of that is very open-ended and dependent on what you need and what you're working on. So a really good first step is to have these discussions right now and be able to know where to pick it up from there. Um, what do we consider most successful? I think um, there's levels to this. Um, I think um, adoption is one of the best forms of flattery, um, especially in open source. If people are using what you're building, it means a lot. And so we really just like to see um, that people are using the tools. And how we are able to tell is uh, GitHub is issues are usually fired up with you know requests for additional features, or people just providing pull requests saying, I think you should add this, or this isn't working, please fix this or when is this new feature going to come and so having a lot of that discussion to me is shows a lot of win um, and yeah <laughs> okay thank you very much for that and if you join me in thanking thanking Sarah again we'll get our next speaker up thank you